In this video, I'm going to be helping a friend of mine, Alex, fit some wooden flooring in his kitchen. When he moved into his house a couple of years ago, his kitchen had a tiled floor which extended into his dining room. The tiling in the kitchen has always been fine because it was laid on a concrete foundation, but the part that extended into the dining room was tiled over a wooden floor, which is obviously a bit of a recipe for disaster because wood moves and it's not a solid enough foundation to tile over. So over time, the tiles and the ground cracked. So a few days ago he went and bought some spruce wooden tongue and groove flooring and he wants that laid over the existing tiled floor and he's already removed all of the cracked tiles in the area that extends into his dining room and that means there's a small height difference that we need to make up for which is around 10 millimeters. So before I head over to his house I'm going to plane some boards to that thickness to use as battens to raise the floor. I could use this as an opportunity to use up any scraps of wood that I didn't think would be useful in other projects. Before I run these pieces through the thickness planer, I'm just going to check with a magnet to see if there are any nails still in the wood. And it's a good job I did that as there's one right at the end here. And it's a big one too. I planed the battens down to 10mm on the thickness planer. These pieces are quite wide so I'm going to rip these in half on the table saw to give me more material to work with. And now I can just bag up anything that I think might be useful on this project and head over to Alex's house. The first thing I did at Alex's house was to check how level the floor was. It was perfectly level in the direction that the floorboards were running, but there was a slight drop off in the other direction from the kitchen into the dining room. However, we were confident that there would be enough give in the floorboards for it not to really matter. Next we unplugged and unplumbed the washing machine and removed the kickboards from the kitchen. The washing machine was placed outside and it became a temporary workbench for the day. After a quick clean up I could begin putting down the battens to raise the floor to the height of the tiles. We used drywall screws for this as they were the right length and that's just what we had available. I used a handsaw to cut the angles and cut the battens to length. In one corner there was a concrete area that was slightly higher than the original floorboards so I marked up where it was onto the batten and used a hand plane to slightly taper the board so that it would sit flush with the kitchen tiles. I tried to space out the battens evenly as the areas in between would later be filled with underlay and we wanted to reduce the amount of awkward angled cuts that we'd need to make. Then we laid a floorboard on and walked over it to check that it felt level and it seemed okay. The next job was to go and get some underlay. underlay. The stuff we chose was 5mm thick and this underlay would help to even out any height inconsistencies before laying the floorboards. Like a lot of old houses, none of the walls were particularly square or straight, so this meant that the underlay and later the floorboards would all need to be cut to fit the shape of the room as best we could. This ultimately made the whole job take much longer than we had expected it to. As the battens in the dining room were 10mm thick, we put two pieces of the 5mm underlay in between them to bring it up to the same height. and then a third layer over the top of the raised floor area to bring it up to the same level as the tiled floor area. The underlay was easy to cut to size, you could just score it and snap it. We later taped down the underlay with some masking tape to stop it moving around. Next I started cutting the floorboards. They were 3 meters long so I made some cuts about 1 meter into some of the boards to give us some differing lengths so that we could stagger the joints. I made all these cuts with my cordless circular saw and a speed square to guide the cuts. 
Before we started laying the floorboards, we were unsure which way up they were supposed to be laid, and there were no instructions included. On the groove side of the tongue and groove boards, there's a thicker piece on one side and a thin piece on the other. We checked on the internet and found that the thicker side should go at the top. I had guessed that the thicker side should be at the bottom, so it's a good job we double checked this before laying them. And it shows how much I know about flooring. Next, I marked up and cut the angles onto the floorboards at the dining room end. I set the bevel gauge to this angle so that I could use that to make repeatable cuts. Next, we laid the floorboards in the space between the cabinets where the washing machine would go. There was a gap left over which was 50mm on one side and 30mm on the other, so we marked up another board and ripped it on the circular saw. This was the first of many angled cuts that we'd need to make. Alex slotted it in and pushed the boards back in place and it was a nice fit. We closed any gaps between the boards as the project went along using some gentle taps with a hammer. One of the boards met a door frame too, so I offered it up and marked it up by hand and cut it out with a jigsaw. I wasn't going for perfection here, really I was just looking to close the gap tight enough so that after a bit of sealant had been applied it would look nice and tidy and it turned out okay. At this point I realised that in one area of the floor the end joints between three of the boards were kind of close together and it didn't look right aesthetically so I removed the middle one and later replaced it with a longer board. So this was the end of day one, at this point we'd probably spent about five hours on the project. On day two we started fitting the final boards. This one needed some cutouts in order for it to fit around the kitchen cabinet legs, so I marked up the locations and cut them out with a jigsaw. And here we are cutting the final pieces to fit by the exterior door. It's recommended when fitting floorboards to leave a small gap for expansion and contraction, but as this was essentially a floating floor, meaning that the majority of the boards wouldn't be secured to the floor, we were confident that there would be enough movement between the boards to allow for this. The final piece didn't seat properly onto the floor, as there was a small lip on the bottom of the door frame, so I used the planer to take off some more material and manoeuvred the board into place with a screwdriver. The next job was to make some edging trim pieces for the ends of the boards. We took down measurements and measured the angle in the dining room with a bevel gauge and a protractor, and it was exactly 45 degrees, which meant that the trim pieces would need to be cut at a 22.5 degree angle in order for them to mate properly. At the other end we would need a piece of trim between the edge of the boards and the bathroom door. So we went over to my workshop, I had a piece of spruce already that I'd been storing behind my sofa. It was pretty long so we took it out through the window, then Alex cut it to a more manageable size with a handsaw. We first started making the trim for the dining room end. I ripped two pieces to 80mm wide and then we used our reference drawing to mark up a shape onto the end of the workpiece using our measurements as a guide. I cut the rebate joints on the table saw with two passes. and then I angled the blade to cut a slope. And then did a bit more shaping with a block plane to round it over. Thank you.
Then we cut the 22.5 degree angle at the mitre saw. We had to use a sacrificial fence here because the workpiece was now a bit of an awkward shape to offer up against the mitre station fence. To fit this piece I marked up some screw locations so that all of the screw heads would be nicely aligned. I think they were 15 centimeters apart and I drilled, countersunk with a 10 mm drill bit as we didn't have a countersink with us and then added the screws. Then I offered up the longer piece of trim and needed to make some adjustments with the block plane to get these two pieces sitting flush with each other. For the second piece of trim, we used an offcut from the slope that we had cut on the previous piece of trim, and this would be used for where the flooring met the exterior door frame. Again, I marked up screw locations and secured it in place, just screwing it to the floorboard. And this is the final trim piece for where the kitchen meets the bathroom door. This piece needed cutting to fit around a door frame, so I did that with the handsaw. This piece also needed to be secured to the tiles, so Alex drilled the holes firstly with a wood drill bit and then a tile cutting bit through that hole. He later added some wall plugs into the tiles and then secured the trim down with screws. And after a bit of hand sanding, the boards were stained with this oak tinted polyurethane varnish. The final job was to rip down the kitchen kickboards to account for the new difference in height. Some of these boards were in pretty bad shape as you can see. And we also used the hand plane to make gradual adjustments and get a nice snug fit for each piece. Then the washing machine could be squeezed back in place. It was a really tight fit, but eventually we got it in there. Not sure if he'll ever get it out again though. Then I left Alex to finish off the staining. Oh dear, the lid is over there. He also applied some sealant to fill any gaps. And this is the finished floor. Overall, we spent around 12 hours on this project over the course of three days. 